Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Shafiq and I would like to welcome all of you in this video session. Today we'll be talking about uh, retaining walls, okay? So basically in this video, I'm gonna cover um, the theory and the step-by-step -step procedure, how to uh, do different type of design for uh, retaining walls, okay? And then I'll post another video in which I'll show you a um, couple of example problems so that you can follow that one to do your homework, okay? Now let me share my screen with you, okay? So we are at the title page of our presentation, which is retaining walls. You can see a picture here. They have retaining walls in three different stages. And you are, we are trying to actually hold the soil here, here, and here so that they can't you know, fall down from there, okay? So that's the basic idea to hold soil. So retaining structures are basically to hold soil. And there are many reasons for that. Basically to improve property appearances, sometimes to create a flat area, make a slope useful. Sometimes it provides handicap accessibility, improve site drainage. You can see in this picture, actually we have provided you know, weep holes here, like this is your weep holes and this is a selected uh, fill which has very high hydraulic conductivity. So water can flow through this perforated drain pipe and then can pass the water through that hole to the other side, okay? And then hold back water. That's actually a little bit different than holding soil. In many times, you know that when we make piers inside a river or sea, then basically we have to build a coffer dam with sheet piles or other kind of piles so that the water cannot get into that enclosed area when you put your concrete foundation there, okay? So that's a little bit different objective than most of the retaining walls, which is actually constructed to hold the soil, okay? And then basically to simplify maintenance. Now let's go here that what are the different types of retaining walls we can see, okay? So first of all, we see there are two different types based on the stabilized system. So externally stabilized system means there is a wall which is completely independent and this wall supports the soil uh, when the, uh, and provided the support to the soil so that the soil cannot, you know, uh, fall from its location, okay? And then internally stabilized system means basically there is no uh, wall down there, but the soil itself is stabilized with most of the time reinforcement so that the soil doesn't have to any support, physical support other than the reinforcement, okay? There might be or very thin wall down there just for the protection of erosion or the protection of the slope. So that's basically the primary difference between these two different system. This system has wall, which will take the load from the soil. Here, the soil will be stabilized with reinforcement and take its own stability, okay? Now let's see like externally stabilized system. There is basically two different system. One is in situ walls and the conventional walls. In situ walls means like most of the time we usually um, use like different type of piles or drill shafts as a foundation. 
here the conventional wall actually we make a foundation and on the foundation we try to make our retaining walls now if you go like in situ walls then basically you will see there are several type of that like sheet pile wall soldier pile wall drill shaft wall and tied back wall okay we'll talk about that a little bit about these walls um, later on now let's go to conventional walls these are basically the part of our syllabus okay we are not going to discuss other than conventional walls that much in this presentation because they are beyond the scope of this course okay so if you see the conventional walls they are basically gravity walls semi gravity walls cantilever walls and counter foot walls actually we will talk a lot about the conventional walls here okay now let's move forward about the type of walls now let's see what are the internally stabilized systems are first of all reinforced soil wall and in situ reinforced wall okay so reinforced soil wall that includes a messy wall means mechanically stabilized earth wall which is very very common in highways and then you also have geotextile or geomembrane walls okay on the other hand the in situ reinforced wall which is soil nail wall or sometimes rock nail wall and reticulated micro pile wall okay so we'll talk about all of them a little bit to show you that what this one looks like and get familiar with that but basically our discussion will be limited here in conventional walls in in that part actually we will just go beyond the normal description we also learn how to design them okay how to analyze them design them and finally uh, make sure that your wall will be uh, stable okay So let's start with gravity wall. What is gravity wall? So this is basically gravity wall. It could be plain concrete or stone masonry. You can see here the bottom is a little bit wider than the top. This is concrete one here. So this wall, gravity type wall, is constructed with the with a plan that that the weight of the wall will actually hold the uh, you know like the force that's coming from the horizontal direction and provide enough stability so that the wall will not fail okay so what is the characteristics of that gravity wall so they are generally econ economical up to 10 feet of height for cast concrete structures usually are sufficient sufficiently massive to be uh, uh, unreinforced so we don't actually reinforce that concrete and this is a monolithic cast wall are generally formed inside okay this is monolithic cast but many times these days we also see modular you know blocks that you can bring there and make your gravity type walls okay now let's see the next one which is basically semi-gravity retaining wall which is basically we try to make this one a little bit thinner and try to use a little bit of reinforcement so that the thickness of the wall is not that high. So you can see a couple of pictures here for semi, you know, gravity wall. And basically this is just the blend of the cantilever wall as well as and the gravity wall design. Okay, so what are the characteristics of semi-gravity wall? So that minimizes the size of the wall sections. Okay, so you need less concrete, but you need a little bit reinforcement there. Okay. Now the third one is basically cantilever, you know, retaining wall, which is more and more common these days. 
you need like reinforcement here, but actually your wall thickness would be much smaller, much thinner in that case, okay? So you can see here that the width of the wall here is not that much compared to here, and we have more reinforcement here. Okay, so that the moment created from that horizontal load and try to overturn that one will be taken by the, you know, like tension by this reinforcement here. Now you can also see the cantilever retaining wall could be either you know, precast here. If these are precast cantilever wall, you are just, they are just putting that here and they will fill that one with soil. Here you, you see this one is cast in place, okay? This is your foundation and this is your actual wall here, okay? Now, what are the characteristics of cantilever wall? It is basically use much less concrete than gravity walls, but require more design and careful construction because you have to reinforce them, okay? generally economically up to 25 feet in height. As we said earlier, that gravity wall is good for only 10 feet height. So if you go more height, then the basically cantilever, you know, like retaining wall would be, you know, more appropriate in that situation. And again, it can be either precast or cast in place. We have both options open here. The fourth type of wall is counterfort retaining wall, which means like if you see the cross section here, this one is basically a cantilever wall, but the cantilever wall has to design so that it can take huge amount of moment from the horizontal pressure that's come from the soil so basically they have several counter fort at a certain distance so that they can take a lot of moment here, okay? So it could be either concrete or it could be masonry wall, okay? So generally they are economical up to 25 feet in height, can be precast or um, it could be also cast in place, okay? So the primary reason for that counter fort, sometimes we also call that one buttress. Basically this buttress or this counter fort is, is to protect the moment that will be created by the horizontal load from the soil, okay? Now, if we see the, you know, like usage in like in Texas. So from, August 2010 to September 2011, just in one year. This is provided by TexDOT. You can see this is the pie chart here. 72% is MSE wall, mechanically stabilized earth wall, okay? And then this is concrete block, only 1%. You see that chart here also, you can see it's just 1%, cantilever drill shaft, that's 2%, soil nail, 3%, rock nailed, 5%, tie back, 4%, spread footing, that's actually like also the conventional, you know, like retaining wall, that's actually 12%, and the other is 1%. So basically we see for text dot purpose, they only use 15%, you know, like, cases where the retaining walls is actually conventional retaining walls. Most of the other cases they use, you know, like other type of walls. But this percentage of conventional wall would be much higher when you go for land development, you know, like for housing and everything, uh, could be as much as uh, 60, 70%. So I think that like, now we also need to know a little bit about the other type of retaining walls, even though we are not gonna discuss in depth, but at least you can understand like a, what kind of retaining wall is that, okay? Now let's take a look. So externally stabilized 
in situ walls. As I said earlier, that this is sheet pile, okay? Sheet pile. So you can see these are sheet piles here. This is the cross section of the sheet piles. These are sheet you know, piles. It's like if you see the cross section that looks like that, and you can make a joint here, or you can make a different joint here. So you can make like a bigger size of that. So they come with different sections, okay? And the thickness of that sheet depends on how long, you know, like a how tall wall you are trying to build, okay? So this is basically a case and you are just trying to make a pier inside water. So what we usually do, make a wall with the sheet pile here, and then basically we use pump to take the water out from there, but still sometimes we can see some of the, some, you know, the water will try to seep through. So basically uh, we try to take that water with the pump, you know, 24 hours, that as soon as it gets inside there, we'll take it out from there, okay? And then we put our foundation here. And when the foundation is done, we are at the top of the um, water, then basically we'll just take the whole thing out from there. So in this case, the wall is not only responsible to hold the soil, but also the water, okay? Now, the second type is soldier pile wall, okay? So soldier pile wall is like you usually put a pile here, a certain distance, depending on like what is the pressure that's coming from there so that the soldier pile can hold that pressure from there, okay? So you can see these are, just, are the you know, columns on top of the soldier piles, okay? And once you have that column, then you fill that one with either uh, concrete blocks, sometimes with timber, sometimes with metals, okay? So that's your choice. Now let's see the other type of externally stabilized in situ walls. This one is drill shaft. Drill shaft is nothing but actually uh, piles, but little bigger size, okay? So you can see what they have to do. They are just putting all the drill shaft, you know, casting in place, usually like this, okay? Casting in place. Once this one has going to a certain distance, once you are done with the casting, then basically you are taking the soil out from this side. So basically you start from a plain land, okay? So you are just putting one after one, one after another, one after another, something like that. Once you just create a line, then basically you use your backhoe and cut the other side, okay? Which is, you can see most of the time at the abutment of any bridge, okay? If you look like the um, intersection of two, uh, two roads or highways, then basically you will see just near the abutment, you will have something like this, okay? Now, this one is tied back wall. You can see here, this is actually your wall, and then you are trying to tie that one back with the soil here. You can either use, you know, like this is kind of helical string, or sometimes you can use a uh, galvanized plate anchor. Sometimes you can use a dead man, okay? Now, how far you have to go from there, you can see if this is your wall here, then this is the line where this one will fail. So basically, we have to keep our support at least the other side of that line so that if the soil fails along that line, this part will not fail, okay? That's the primary objective of this tieback wall, okay? Now let's see some internally, you know, stabilized uh, reinforced. First of all, we'll talk about reinforced soil walls, okay? 
So this is basically the MSC wall. MSC wall, you can see all the time, you know, like any intersection of highway. And definitely this is one of the most, you know, favored, you know, system for highway people, okay? So you can see here that these are the, actually you can see these are actually the reinforcement that's coming from here to this way. So they are trying to hold that wall within the soil using that reinforcement, okay? So here, actually, the wall is not supporting the soil. Actually, uh, the soil is trying to support that wall here through the reinforcement, okay? Now, let's see here. Another type is actually, this one is your geofabric or geotextile reinforced wall. Here we usually use metallic strips. Here we are using a different type of geomembranes or geotextile. So you can see for a certain, you know, like height, we fill that one with water and then we wrap that up and take that geotextile all the way here. Then we put another geotextile here fill that one with certain height of soil and then wrap that up again here. And if you see, again, this is the line where this one was supposed to fail, which is 45 plus three by two degrees, okay, fail. So this reinforcement has to go from all the way, you know, passed through that line, okay? So that it cannot fail along that line or a little bit more on that line here too, okay? That's the primary objective of this type of uh, internally stabilized reinforced soil wall. The next one is internally stabilized in situ retaining wall. So here, basically what we are doing, this is called the soil nail wall. You can see there is a very thin wall here and these are the nails that's going far away inside the soil, okay? So once, if you see this one is done, you know, like you usually put a little bit concrete here or cement paste here. So this side will provide uh, protection against, you know, like any uh, soil erosion. And basically this is a passive system. So if you see the cross section of that one, then basically these are the soil nails, very long nails here, usually one inch, you know, reinforcement um, rod that will just pass through maybe 15, 20, 30, you know, feet from the face of the wall. And again, the design methodology is same. Like if you have the line here that the soil will fail along that line, they will just pass that one in such a way that it cannot fail along that line anymore because of this reinforcement, okay? Now, this is also very, very common, but there is another one here, which is called reticulated micropile wall which is you can see here at the top of the top, there is a concrete cap. And from that cap, these are micro piles with, you know, like different, maybe concrete or uh, steel, other kind of micro piles there. So the same thing is here, like if you, the soil has to fail, then this one has to go like 45 plus three degree here. And you can see that you have reinforcement in that area, so it doesn't allow that to happen, okay? But this is not that common. This is just like uh, one company from Micropile, you know, like trying to push that system. But this soil nail wall is, is much more popular for most of the highway people, okay? Now let's go back to um, design procedure for conventional retaining walls, okay? So there are two phases of the design for conventional retaining wall. You know, like as we know the lateral art pressure system, we just try to make a structure so that it doesn't fail due to overturning, sliding, or bearing capacity failure. 
So we have to check that one, that this one has enough factor of safety against overturning, sliding, and bearing capacity, which we'll talk very elaborately in, our, in the next slide, okay? And then the second part is the kind of like your reinforced design, you know, like how you make sure that the in structural integrity of the component of the wall doesn't fail, okay? So that's not basically the part of this course. So here we will primarily focus on whether the wall will be, you know, stable enough against the overturning, sliding, and bearing capacity failure, okay? Now, one thing before I go there, I have to tell that one to you that every time you design a wall, uh, basically you have to come up with a trial section, okay? And then once you get the trial section, you just try to see, hey, what would be the factor of safety against overturning? What are the factor of safety against sliding? And what are the factor of safety against bearing capacity failure? If this one is adequate, means like your trial section is okay. If the factor of safety is not adequate, then basically you have to choose a different section, okay? Now, how to choose the section? That's also called the proportioning of the you know, retaining walls. So there is some guide here uh, that you can follow. So you can see uh, these are that proportioning thing here, like for, this is for gravity wall and this is for cantilever wall. So for gravity wall, which is not that common these days anymore because the, you know, the cost of concrete is so high compared to reinforcement wall that people most likely use this one. But they gave you this one like that top would be 0.3 meter. The bottom has to be 0.5 to 0.7 of your H. H is the total height of the wall, okay? H is the total height of the wall. The heel part has to be 0.12 to 0.17 H. And here is your toe part, which has to be from here to here, which is 0.12 to 0.17. Okay, so this height and this distance has to be similar. The minimum, you know, like slope here has to be 0.2%, okay? And same thing here that you can see if this is one, this one has to be 0.02 means like 2% slope. Here, this one has to be 0.3 meter minimum, same as here. This one has to 0.7 to 0.5 to 0.7 H. H is the total height of the wall. So they provided, you know, like some, you know, like guidance that how you can first pick a um, section and if your section doesn't wo work, means like your stability is not adequate, then basically you change the section, okay? And once you check the section, basically you have to recheck all this stability factor and make sure that this wall is safe enough. Now let's talk about the application of the lateral earth pressure to design retaining walls. You already learned, you know, like what are the lateral earth pressure based on Rankine's method and based on Coulomb's method. But how we usually try to apply that one on a retaining structure, okay? So first of all, for Rankine's method, you can see if this is your wall, then basically you just go to the hill point here and draw a straight line, okay? Draw a straight line here. And then basically your ranking active pressure is working on that line AB, okay? So 
you just try to find out the height of AB, and this one is basically one third of the length of AB here, where this pressure, Rankine's active pressure works. And this one has an angle alpha, okay? This angle is alpha here, which is the angle of the inclined plane here. So you just apply this Rankine force here, then you can see the soil in that area and also the weight of the wall itself will try to hold that one. On the other hand, the component of that force in the horizontal direction that will try to push that one in this direction, okay? This one will also create a moment for overturning, okay? So we have to make sure that this one is stable enough either overturning or from sliding or from bearing capacity failure means like this way, if the bearing capacity fails occurs, then basically there will be substantial settlement and eventually this one will fail, right? So similar to Rankin's method, we also have a procedure that how, uh, how you can uh, use Coulomb's theory in order to put the uh, Coulomb's pressure here, active pressure here. You can remember that for uh, Rankine's method, we usually draw a line here and the force work on that line AB. But for Coulomb's method, this force, active force, directly work uh, on the wall itself, okay? And you can see this is the perpendicular line of this phase, okay? And then this one makes a delta prime angle with this perpendicular line here. So when you try to find out the stability analysis, then basically you don't have to consider the soil here, okay? If I go back here, you can see we, here actually we have to consider the weight of the soil here according to Rankine's method. But for Coulomb's method, since this one is directly acting on the wall, so we usually don't count the weight of the soil here. Only count the weight of the, you know, like the structure here. Okay. So, now, what are the stability check we have to do? Okay, so a retaining wall may fail in any of the following four ways. First of all, it may overturn about its toe. Okay, we'll talk elaborately about that. Second, it may slide along its base. Okay. Third is it may fail due to the loss of bearing capacity of the soil supporting the base. And number fourth is kind of deep-seated shear failure, or sometimes we call that one is kind of global stability that the slope will not fail there, okay? This one actually fails not within the wall. It's much deeper than the wall, okay? So this is basically the last part, like the number four, is basically a global stabilization problem, what we usually analyze in slope stability course, okay? So usually we check the first three here to make sure that your wall is safe enough, okay? The number four one can be done only in special cases, if we see there is a very weak layer of soil below the you know, foundation of the wall, uh, very close to the foundation of the wall, means like most of the time 1.5B depth, okay? If we see any weak layer within the depth of 1.5B, then basically we must have to check the deep-seated shear failure criteria, okay? Now let's see one by one that how usually we can find out that stability for each of the cases, okay? So first of all, this is stability against 
uh, overturning. So you can see here that this is your wall, this is your soil here, and this soil has creating some pressure here, okay? A force here, which will try to overturn that one, okay? So same thing here. When you take a moment here, if you see that your moment in this direction is higher than the moment in this direction, so this one is gonna overturn. That's the same thing here, okay? And you can see from that picture, that overturning is not a good thing, you know, like it's not gonna work, okay? So you can see here a couple of cases, like this is actually a retaining wall here, which is failed because of the overturning. I'm trying to show that one here again, like if you push that building, you know, like horizontally, sometimes this one will try to overturn, okay? Now, how we can find out the stability against the overturning? So your factor of safety against overturning is summation of force, summation of moment that's trying to resist and divided by the summation of moment that's trying to overturn, okay? That's your factor of safety. Now, this is the summation of moment of forces tended, tending to overturn about point C here. If you see that figure here, this is C here. So when you are trying to push that one in this direction, so this is your PA, which has two components. One is horizontal components is PH. The vertical component is PV. Now, when you are trying to push that one this way, this one will try to react there. And also like the force, you know, working frictional force working here too. So, you can see here, like this one is also, if you take a moment at point C, that pH will try to overturn that one, okay? On the other hand, the forces like PV, that's actually the moment in the clockwise direction. This is the moment is anti-clockwise, counterclockwise direction, okay? Who is trying to resist any clockwise moment? Who are those? With respect to C, you can see like PV, the weight of this soil and the weight of this wall, all of them are actually clockwise with respect to C. And you can also see that when you are trying to push that one, there will be passive force here, okay? So the passive force is also clockwise. So basically, we have to calculate the whole thing here and your factor of shifts safety against the overturning should be within two and three. Now it's your freedom. If it is 2.5, you can keep that one like that. But if you have 1.85, definitely you have to, you know, retrial that one, okay? Now we are trying to show you like, hey, how we can calculate that one here as I was showing you the overturning moment the overturning moment, that's actually pH, okay? pH, pH is actually pA cosine alpha, pA cosine alpha multiplied by the distance from here to here, which is actually H prime by three, H prime by three. Now, if you try to say that who is trying to resist that overturning moment, okay? So there are three components from there. First of all, this passive force here, okay? So if this is the passive force and the height of the soil in this part is D, then the basically this one is actually, we are assuming that one PP is equal to D divided by three, even though this is not exactly uh, triangular load, it's basically trapezoidal load. If you can find out the trapezoid, you know, like you can definitely use that one, but sometimes the rule of thumb is use D by three. If you can find out the centroidal distance of the uh, trapezoid, that would be actually more uh, appropriate, okay? The other thing which is very, very important here that even though we are using like here, like Rankin's method, 
we are finding out our PP also in Rankine's method. When we are using, let's say for Coulomb's method, at that time, we usually use Rankine's method to find out our PP here, okay? Means like your passive force here. So here, you know, like the active condition could be different for, you know, Rankine's method and Coulomb's method, but in the other side, actually, most of the time we usually use Rankine's method. But if you want to use Coulomb's method, that would be okay too. Okay. Now, the second resistance is coming from the PV. PV is just the vertical component of the active force. Okay. So that's actually PA sine alpha here. PA cosine alpha. PA sine alpha, okay? Multiplied by the distance of that force, which is from here to here is actually B, okay? And then from the weight of the soil and structure. So if this is your soil and the centroid is here, then weight multiplied by the this perpendicular distance from here to the centroid of that load is basically the moment that's working you know, like clockwise. Similarly, if I take the moment of, you know, like the calculate the weight of this one and find out the centroid here. So this weight multiplied by the distance from here to here, that's actually the moment created by this segment here. So we have to just find out for each of the segment here, you can see they are showing here each of the segment, like segment one, segment two, segment three, segment four, and segment five. For each of the segment, actually, you have to find out the total weight and the centroidal distance from point C. Once you find that out, then basically you can add all of them together to find out the total resisting moment from the weight of the soil and wall, okay? So you then you add all of them together to find out your total resisting moment, okay? So this is the total resisting moment would be, this is from your force here, this is the force from here, and this is the force from weight of the soil and structure, okay? So finally, so finally, you have to just, let me go back here, that you have to use this one in this equation here to see actually what is your factor of safety against overturning. If it is within two or three, two and three, then basically you are fine with your design, okay? Now, the second one is your stability against sliding, okay? Many times we see that when you are applying that horizontal load, actually this one is slipping rather than overturning, okay? So something like that, you know, like the sliding duck. If we have some kind of force in this direction, this one is kind of sliding in this way, okay? So that's one of the pictures in Malaysia that you can see the horizontal force from the soil actually pushed that retaining structure in that way, failed the whole thing and the soil is going down because this one has been pushed through. So, so soil has tried to fill that area. Okay. So what is that factor of safety against sliding? That you can see that's actually factor of safety against sliding is the summation of force that's trying to resist that sliding and summation of force that's trying to push the wall, okay? So if you see here, if you take the summation of Fx, means like in the horizontal direction, so you can see this is trying to push, like Fd is basically pH and who is trying to resist? This force plus the friction at the bottom here, okay? Now, if you see the resistance force 
R prime, which is below that slab, that's basically tau into area. The force is you know, stress into area. And now tau is basically sigma prime tan delta prime plus Ca, where sigma prime is the normal stress. Delta prime is the uh, angle of friction between the slab and the soil below there. And Ca prime is the cohesion between the soil and the wall. Okay, so that's the part here. Like now you have to add PP with that as the resisting force for sliding. Okay, so let's move forward and see here that horizontal resist resisting force is total is basically this part from R plus PP. Now if I plug that value here, okay, so my normal force is basically, normal stress is basically normal force divided by the area. Area is basically B into one because this is the width is B in the other direction. This is just one or unit length. So if I plug that value, finally I get this one here that my total horizontal resistance force is this one. Okay, so, and I already know that the horizontal driving force is P A cosine alpha. So if I put everything here, like the air factor of safety against sliding, that's basically the resisting force divided by the driving force in the horizontal direction. Okay, so basically, um, if you're sliding, you know, factor of safety, is within two and three, we'll say that, hey, this section is good enough. If not, then we have to make some additional changes, you know, like, or we have to change our section. Now you can see there are some guidelines that what you can do when your factor of safety against sliding is a little less than two, okay? So you can just modify the section. Now, how you can, if you see that equation here, so you can see that your factor of safety against sliding is basically, uh, you know, summation of resisting force divided by your driving force. Now, how you can increase that FS is like, if you increase here, right, the resistance, if you increase the resistance force, then basically this one will increase or you can just decrease the driving force that will cause the FS to increase too, right? So there is two different method. One is increasing the resisting, resisting strength and the second one is reducing the driving force. Now, how we can just increase the resisting force here? So you can see like there are a couple of compon components here. First off, increase the width of the base slab. So you can just increase the width of the base slab. If you increase that one, then basically your B is increasing. When B is increasing means like this one is increasing, okay? And second one is like use a key to the base slab here. You can see there is a key here. Now I just added that key here. So what will happen like when you add that one, then basically your D1 is now much bigger than your D. So this PP will increase, okay? So the resisting force PP will increase. And if you increase that one, then basically this part will increase too, okay? The other thing is like you can just you know, use a uh, anchor here to hold that wall at a certain point. We call that one dead man anchor, okay? So dead man anchor, you just put that one and try to hold that whole wall here. So these are the three methods to increase your resisting force. And there is another method by doing, you know, like reducing the driving force, which is you can see here that they just make that one like a little bit inclined here. So your, you know, horizontal pressure changes a little bit. 
but I don't, when I was working over the years, you know, like I, I have a feeling like this one is not a significant, you know, it's, it's not a method we can actually change the factor of safe, safety significantly, okay? So the most um, useful method is basically use a key, okay? At the bottom of that slab. Now let's move forward and try to see that uh, uh, the stability against uh, the uh, bearing capacity failure. Okay, so you can see this is from Turkey actually. It's a big wall here, and there was a big wall along that line here. And this one failed because of the uh, bearing capacity problem. And you can see all the curves, you know, they came down from here to here. Fortunately, nobody died during that incident. Okay, but very, you know, like, you know kind of like uh, important situation that happened in uh, Istanbul, Turkey. Now you can see there are two different ways it can fail. One is because of the bearing capacity failure. The other one, it can undergo deep seated shear failure. But as I said earlier, that this one is like more important and we usually try to see the stability against the bearing capacity failure, okay? So if I go here, then you can see that's actually the other cases, you know, like in Istanbul, Turkey too, because there was a wall here. You can see this is the wall which the part here has destroyed. So basically this building and this building and this building is now in danger and they, will, they could collapse anytime. Okay, so they made a wall here and then they built this house. Now, when the wall failed, a lot of soil from the below of that building actually failed there too. Okay, so basically your factor of safety against the bearing capacity failure is QU divided by Q max. QU is the ultimate bearing capacity of the soil and Q max is the maximum bearing pressure that's coming from the from the wall to the soil. Okay, so if your factor of safety has to be usually three for the uh, bearing capacity uh, failure. Okay, if it is less than three, then you have to double check your section. Now, how we can find out the, uh, the ultimate wearing capacity of the uh, soil. That's basically the same thing what you learned in chapter six, like the wearing uh, capacity for spread footing, okay? But here actually for a wall, this one is kind of continuous wall, you know, like which has a width of B and a very long L, okay? So you can see here, since this is a very long wall and continuous footing, then basically there is no shape factor here, here, and here. Shape factor, all of them are equal to one and has been ignored from there, okay? Since this is a wall is continuous, the shape factors are ignored. And the second thing, it is only one way eccentric because this is not a, rectangular, you know, like uh, thing. It's just continuous in this direction. So it can just like go like this, okay? So you have just only one with eccentric. So you can find out the eccentricity using this equation here. Like find out your X bar. X bar is the distance from point C uh, to the resultant vertical force, okay? And that's basically summation of resisting moment minus the summation of overturning moment divided by your uh, V, summation of V, that will give you the X bar 
and you can find out your E equal to B by two minus X bar here. Now, if your E is greater than one sixth, then basically we have to, you know, change your section, okay? Most of the cases it won't be when your E is just equal to one by six, at that time the pressure would be zero here and the pressure would be maximum here, right? If your E is greater than one six, then basically you will see some part of here will not, you know, like take any soil reaction. They will just come out from there, okay? So in that situation, actually, we have to retrial that section, okay? So your Q equal to gamma 2D and your B prime is equal to B minus 2E. So you have to use B prime when you calculate your ultimate bearing capacity. And you can see since the depth of foundation DF is very shallow for this wall. So most of the time your DF by B is less than one. And if your phi is greater than zero, then basically you have to use this equation most of the time. If your phi equal to zero, then you may have like different equation, right? And most of the cases you will see there is some inclination here because of this force working here and this force working here. So you can find out that, you know, psi not, you know, like using this equation 10 inverse PA cosine alpha divided by summation of V. Once you get this angle, then basically you can find out your phi CI and now your FCI and FQI from this equation and F gamma I from this equation. Okay, once you get all those values, plug that one in your bearing capacity equation and find out the bearing ultimate bearing capacity of the soil. Now, how you calculate the maximum pressure? You just try to see the maximum pressure using this equation here you find out your minimum pressure is this much. But minimum pressure is not that important. The most important thing, your maximum pressure, to make sure that your maximum pressure is much lower than your ultimate bearing capacity, right? So your factor of safety is basically your Q max divided by Q U, okay? So and you have to have at least factor of safety of three means like your QU has to be more than three times higher than your Q max, okay? Now that's the, you know, like global stability check. We usually don't do that one. If a weak layer of soil is located in shallow depth means like 1.5 times of the width of the base, then a globe, global stability check is required. Otherwise, you don't have to do that one, okay? So a deep shear failure can occur along the cylindrical surface such as ABC shown in the figure below. You can see like the failure surface is just like this because this is weak soil and the shear strength from here to here is basically very, very low, like the resisting shear. So this one can fail along that line or this line here, and it's not within the wall. That's why sometimes your wall might be intact, okay? Even after failure, you can see this is a actually a slow failure here. So your wall is actually intact, but this one has failed from the soil, okay? So that's about it. So if you have any question, please feel free to contact me by email or just uh, any other means of like Skype or uh, uh, FaceTime, okay? And then I'm gonna pro provide another video to show some of the example problems. If you see that two videos, then basically you will be able to answer any question about that uh retaining walls also you'll be able to do your homework problem
anyway thank you for watching